a few years ago, uh, uh, well, well, many years ago, Avea started on her birthday doing trash pickups. And um, she's inspired that to be part of something that's in the, the culture of the nature journaling community. And so the um, on my birthday, at some point, I'm going to be out there in nature journaling and picking up trash. And I'd just like to invite everybody who has a hankering to, to use it as an excuse to pick up your journal, go out, have a little adventure. But also, um, I, I now have, because of Ivea, I have, as part of my nature journaling kit, um, a little trash bag. And so it's really interesting to pay attention to just how your feeling about a place changes um, when you have done a little bit of work to take care of it. Um, there is, it's there's sort of a strange at, sort of reverse um, psychology aspect um, of human human nature that was discovered by Benjamin Franklin. There was a a, a person who um, was an opponent of his and was constantly sort of butting heads with him and stopping a lot of the things that he wanted to do. Um, that person had a big library of books. And what uh, Benjamin Franklin did is uh, in those days, you know, books, it's not like you could go, he could go down to Barnes and Noble. Um, the, uh, but what he did is he asked to borrow um, one of these books, a really rare special book and the, uh, the gentleman agreed. And then he uh, read the book, gave it back with a nice note. And from that point forward, um, they were friends and allies. Isn't that interesting? So what, what he did was he actually asked somebody else to do something for him. And then the result of but what our brains do is we say like, oh, I'm being nice to this person. I must like them. And so we think that like, if I do nice things for the other person, then they're going to like me. It turns out that if the other person does nice things for you, then they like you um, or both. So we can actually use that little bit of psychology to connect us more deeply with the natural world. If we take care of a place, our brain says, oh, I'm taking care of this place. This place is special to me. And you will actually, you will feel physically fundamentally different about the place that you're in because you did just, you stood up and did a little bit of stewardship there. And um, so yes, and, and, it, and it's the place that you're leaving um, is, is better because you were there and you have this, this feeling of deeper connection with it. So um, consider that as kind of a hack for developing an even stronger nature connection. Um, the place that you step up to take care of will become even more dear and special to you. And that just makes this world a, a, a better place because there's less trash, sure, um, but also just inside your heart. Um, now, um, let me take a look. Um, it looks like, you know, there's, 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 there was, there's a couple of things pointing us towards, um, towards the frogs. Um, Susan is, um, learning frog sounds and Holly is interested in sketching some frogs. Um, so I think it would be interesting to, um, let's, let's start with drawing some frogs and then we'll bring in Susan and ask, pick her brain about how she's documenting, um, frog sounds. And maybe we, I've got some tricks that I use for drawing bird sounds and I'll bet a bunch of those would be, um, also useful for, for the frog sounds. Um, but I'd be interested to see what Susan's up to with that. So let's check out some frogs. Um, I am going to find, um, I've actually got a, um, the other day when I was going to do um, 
I, I had all the good intentions of doing frogs and ended up doing a salamander. But that, um, that same presentation has some resources on some frog stuff that is, is really relevant. So I'm going to make use of that. And I am going to make use of my document camera. Focus. Um, so frogs, bless their little froggy hearts, have, um, there is um, sort of a number of interesting features to, to notice about the frog. Um, one is that there's a smooth glandular skin, um, often is wet. Um, so frogs, if they dry out, they are unhappy dead frogs. And so um, kind of giving them a little bit of um, a hint of light is going to be helpful. Get some light sparkling off them. Here I've done that with, first I did drawing in watercolor and then all the white in there is a Prismacolor pencil kind of putting in just a few little places where there is um, some light bouncing off it. I think I actually could have made those even bigger, bolder white spots and it would feel wetter. So this one feels like this little frog is starting to dry out. But here's a couple of cool features. Um, so a, uh, there's a, a large circle behind the eye of the frog. That's its eardrum. Um, on male bullfrogs, this is a bullfrog, the eardrum is bigger, it's smaller in female, so you can tell the sexes apart by looking at that. Um, other interesting things to note about this frog is these big froggy protruding eyes. Um, and also notice this kind of uh, bump in the back. We'll be looking at what that is anatomically in a moment. Um, but uh, that is, there's sort of part of the topography of the frog. There's this sort of strange bump, very almost kind of squirrel-like. If you've looked at a lot of squirrels, squirrels have this big kind of bump back look going on. And this character does too. Four toes in the front, five in the back. Back are webbed. And um, the back leg also folds up doing this really neat S curve. So this is where the hip is, where my arrow is. Its knee is out here. This is its heel. And this part flopping along here, that is the essentially the instep, the metatarsal bones of the frog going out to the toes. Here we have um, a tree frog, or now it's called the Pacific chorus frog. This one's looking a little bit wetter. And take a look back between these two. What is it that is making this one feel a little bit wetter? Well, hey, not you. Between this one and this one. It feels just a little bit more glistening. What did it is the gouache. This one has bigger white spots, more crisp, clear white spots. And that feels like the light is bouncing off of it uh, just a little bit more brilliantly. And that is what makes this one feel a little bit more dry. This one feel a little bit wet, especially out here on the leg. Got these white spots along here, right along here, you got a feeling, oh yeah, you're a little wet froggy. Those details, the little white reflections come on at the end, it's sort of a fun part of it. Um, other things to notice again, let's look at the back leg, hip, knee, heel, instep, then out to the toes. And see how that instep folds along there. So that gives you this S shape in the leg. So the leg has this full S shape. The front leg is just an L, an L out to the little frog. Nice articulated little toes, we'll see on a lot of that. So, um, how um, I'm going to sort of walk through some of the, the things on, on drawing um, a, a, a frog here. Um, oh, let me see, I can turn this off. Um, when I'm thinking about kind of the froggy preliminary drawing, um, 
very often I will start with just sort of a blog that you know, sort of my frog is sitting in this general direction. And then I'm going to make that a little bit more articulate. My frog has sort of a head upper body section. And then there's a bump that sticks up. And my little frog friend has a the back it comes down. So the, the back comes up. There's this little sort of strange bump. You look at what caused that. And if you look at what I'm doing here on the screen, I'll make some of these lines a little bit longer. I'm making this, this bump kind of boxy, like it's robo frog. Um, and I'm going to make, I could even make my, my head here a little bit boxy. If this is the top surface of my head. Um, there, there's a sort of side of that sticking down. I want this line to be parallel with this line, to be parallel with this line, to be parallel with, oh, look at that, this line. See how I'm off at an angle there? I don't want that. I want this to be a symmetrical frog. Um, so, Right. So yeah, notice that I had this at this angle, but I want it up at this angle. That that's going to keep my my frog back parallel with my frog head. Similarly, my eyes want to be parallel with these lines. So my eyes are going to come through here, and I'm going to just put draw in a big ball for both of those. This one here, this big ball is sticking up over the edge. This one is interior. And then here's the back side of my head. In this area here is going to be my big folded up S shaped leg. And remembering that it's an S shaped leg is going to be very, very helpful in um, being able to, 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 to draw it in. For now, I'm just putting that ball of that folded up S. And my little frog friend has an elbow. A little form there. So I'm thinking boxy, I'm thinking geometric. Um, here I've drawn this with my graphite pencil, which makes it kind of bold and in your face. Um, I would probably be doing this with, if I'm just drawing this on my own, have sketched this into this point with my non photo blue pencil. But that, because that makes these nice little ghosty lines, but you can't see those on the uh, on the projection thing. Um, on top of a framework like this is where I draw my details. Okay, I know that's a big step. We're here, like, and draw the rest of the phone. Um, but we'll, we'll get into some of these, these, these other froggy details here. Um, but let's, let's just play with this a little bit. Um, so I'm going to make this, this, this eye here. What you want to do on the frog eye is really consider it a sphere. Consider the frog eye to be a sphere, not a circle. And what you're going to be doing is wrapping the skin around this. So if this is truly a sphere here, just sort of put some globe lines on it. Um, actually, I'm going to make this a full circle.
then when I am wrapping skin over it, that skin is going to be following those sorts of contours. So I want to think of how this round ball projects into the skin on the other side. So if this is looking more forward, here is my sphere. And here's one way of kind of constructing this. I'm just drawing a circle with some kind of moon crescents out from it. And I can do the same in this direction as well. So you don't have to do latitude and longitude like I did here. And then I want to think of, all right, so let's say this one is, if this eye here was kind of looking in this direction. Um, this one, we're going to make it looking more in this direction. So that means that this skin here is going to wrap more around And you can always just look at the eye itself. The shape but bearing in mind that you've got this sort of rounded form that you're tucking underneath the skin. If your brain is holding that as a sphere, it's gonna help you kind of tuck these things around the edge here like that and kind of make that feel like it is, I'm gonna put in a little horizontal people here. And Bronx have that. Um, so more space here than here, because the dog is looking in this direction. So thinking of those eyes as big round things really helps. So here, I'm gonna have this big eye. Um, and it's going to be... Oh, Jack, um, would you mind sliding your froggy over just a little? Oh. Ah, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for it. I get looking down at my piece of paper and not at where I am on the screen. Plus the frog hops. And this one here, it's going to come up. Now the, the sort of the action part of the eye is really pointing away from me. There's a little froggy jaw. Trees all the way back this way. I'm going to give it an eardrum back here on the side of the head, not a circle. I'm going to draw this as more of an ellipse because I'm not looking, I'm looking more down on it. And sometimes there's a little skin around that. Some species of frogs, not all, have these ridges that go up over their back. So the top part of that I can see is a clear line. The bottom edge of that, if I do this, it feels like it's a stripe. It's this tube going over the side of the pen. So what I want to do is have that bottom edge be a lost and found edge. So a lost and found edge, sometimes you see it as a hard line, Sometimes you see it as a soft one, sometimes it's kind of broken up, but this is kind of coming over.
few little kind of skin folds in here. I want my frog throat to be kind of puffed down. Sometimes this part will see it kind of coming back and forth as it breathes. Think of, think of this leg as a three-dimensional form that here, this part is coming out towards you. This part here, And you'll see that very often the, 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 the feet will be angled in the word. The, uh, the uh, middle toes are longer, um, but you can often give your little frogs kind of a, some nice little sort of toey articulation. And so that part comes down. Uh, we got little froggy fingers. Now the Z. Let's put that Z in. Hold it. Um, I want to move my throat up. Um, so here's a little Z leg. Um, going to have some little skin folds to come in here and out to a very boxy knee. The thigh muscle is, a, so is big and it goes all the way back here. But what's overlapping on in front of that and blocking your view of the bigger thigh is this big chunky calf. So I'm going to draw, here's this little you know, skin folds in here, but I have a big calf that comes in here. To a boxy heel. So, and again, think of this as Muscular. This is this is Arnold Schwarzenegger. These are um, not just a flat shape. Um, then we have our instep that comes down, and then we're going to get our froggy toes. There's a fifth one that's just out of my view. This part here is going to come down to a little bump between the legs. And then you're going to see a little bit of the far leg sticking out on this side here. So I've got my eyes aligned, my back bump aligned. This, um, so there's those, those what I call parallel guides have been very helpful. Um, this heel is here, so I want to bring this other heel back to that same point. Kind of, it's, it's easy to kind of get, for my, let me erase that so to do it wrong. I'm going to draw this back leg in, sticking up here and coming in like that, right? It's just really, that's what I originally did, right? I had that line coming in somewhere in there. But if this is these sort of orientation lines of my frog, I draw on another line here that says like, oh, no, Jack, come on back here and let's just make that heel kind of come down to that same point. And that just makes this more sort of parallel uh, geometry of my little froggy friend.
What's going on under the hood? This is the froggy's hip bone. There's my froggy hip bone. Look at that big thing. And it's, um, and so here's my shoulder blade to an elbow wrist. Here is hip, knee, heel, instep, toesies. Right? So this is the same body plan that that I have. Um, the parts of this uh, skeleton, that, that this, this part here, there's tons of movement and articulation that happens right here as part of the spring forward mechanism. So at this point, um, the, the pelvis bends down and part of the jump is propelling this thing forward. And so that's why uh, you'll see this big bump on a lot of frogs. So sometimes they'll sit in an angle that hides it more but very often you'll see this really cool froggy bump uh, stick up on the back. Here's the other joints in the leg, boom, 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 boom. And so hip, knee, heel. Here is, um, this is your instep bones. So those are your um, tarsals, metatarsals. And um, on our little froggy friend here. This one with the leg forward, you can see that also. So hip, knee, heel. You see how that big thigh is in front of, sorry, that big calf is in front of that big thigh. There's a big thigh behind there, but most of what you see in this fold is the calf. Look at this S shape, S shape. That is, that's critical. Here we have a little bit of, we're seeing a little bit of that bump. Um, from the front and the sides, you know, here we want to think about really wrapping these eyes around um, as, as, you're, as you're sort of putting these things into the head. Envision with my forward facing eye here. There's, there's a big eyeball. I want to think of this skin wrapping around that sphere. Same thing from the side. Getting your uh, an, an eye that feels to you like a sphere um, is going to be really helpful. Um, notice that the jaw comes back here all the way behind the mouth, sort of very straight. We'll back up and see that skeleton again. That here's where the eye would be, and the jaw is out here. So big, broad head. Jaw coming all the way here, all the way back here. Here's your ear. This little sketch on the left is a toad. So notice that there are these bumps all over the toad. The toad has warts. And the toad also has these big glands above the ear. That's called the parotid gland. It's a poison gland for making the toad less palatable. And so if I'm going to put toad skin on something. Let's put toad skin on our frog because we can. Um, so I'm going to get rid of these very froggy ridges because the toad doesn't have that. Make this guy a little bit more toady. And if I want this toad to feel more toady, so the first thing, uh, if I'm changing it, morphing it from frog into toad, I'm going to give it poison glands. And the shape of the poison glands is going to be different on different species. And so typically, you'll find them right back in here, behind the eye. 
And so for this one here, I'm going to give it a little top shape. And along the bottom edge, I'm going to give it a little kind of more broken line, little lines flicking up like this, suggesting that there's a change in the plane as we kind of come across here. Right? And then kind of flick up there. Here is this poison gland on this side. So you, you'd want to look at for my toad, what are the what is the actual shape of its poison gland? And it sticks up. So I'm going to just lightly kind of suggest myself where the edge of the shadow of the shadow would be on this, and do that, which just helps pop it up a little bit. And then, oh, this is too bumpy back. Um, I'm then going to put warts on the skin. And so the wart is sort of a round bump that sticks up. But if I draw circles all over it, it look like polka dots. Um, and so what I want to think about are polka dots on, or sorry, warts on a cylinder. So if I have a wart that is on the edge here, I will see that on the edge. So some of those little, little lines in there just sort of help say like, look, here's the inflection point where this bump sticks up. There is another one here. Now, if there's one that is pointing towards me, I'm going to see that as round, but um, usually light is coming more from the top, which means that the bottom side of it is going to be more in shadow. And so I'm going to draw that bump as a little C mark with um, letting the light into the top part. So essentially, I'm drawing the shadow on the side of the bump. And then one over here in this area. Um, so think of if a, a dot in here will be a circle. One in here will be more of an ellipse. So I will give this one a rounded top. And then I am going to kind of curve the bottom of that. And one that is over here, imagine it kind of coming in from an ellipse shape. So now I'm going to apply this cylinder to my friend the toad. And um, I'm going to just start to draw some. Uh, so this part of the body here is going to be pointing towards me. This part of the body here is starting to point to rock away from me. Oh, it's really rocking away, might do that. So I can put in a few warts that are on the surface that's turned away from us. And uh, then in here, there's going to be, I'm going to get some of them different sizes. So pay attention to where these are showing up on your frog. They will be on your toe, they will be sort of randomly scattered around. Um, but I'm going to make these sort of heavier. more serious looking. Yeah. 
down in here, we're kind of getting more on the, the shadow side. Um, over here, there's going to be a big bump, big glands on the top of this, and at the bottom, slightly curved. And over here, one that's facing towards me more. And over here, I can think of this. I'm going to, here's sort of how I'm geometrically thinking about the back of my face down here. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of a surface in here. Actually, that drawing that in helps me think of maybe I want to turn. This one, this one. And then on this flat surface out here. Into the edge down here. Do the bumps. And out here. So when I'm adding in these, 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 the warts, I'm thinking, what is the shape of the landing platform for that? And then I get the top edge of it. And then I want to have some little kind of indication of. Ah, just colored in like poison gun. So here's a very warty, bumpy little character. So notice that some of the, the warts are, this is a Western toad, nice horizontal pupil here. Pay attention to your frog and toad eyes. Um, and the um, Uh, notice that it's also nice to have some of the, the warts break the boundary of sort of be sticking out above the little kind of the, the skyline, the ridge here. It's going to help you sort of see the, let's, let's add some color. Let's, let's take something like this and, and just add a little bit of color to it. Um, so I'm going to use some watercolor here. And let's give this one just a few more, a few more words and all. The first thing I would do is apply the background colors. The generally in watercolor, we go start lighter and move ourselves progressively darker. And so um, in this, there is this lovely yellow stripe right down the middle of the back of the Western toad. Let me check that too. And so I'm gonna put that in. And then I have olive green. I'm gonna take a little bit of oxide of chromium you don't have to have exactly these colors. I'm just naming some of the colors, not because you need to have those in your palette, but because just so you can, uh, if you are kind of following along with me, I'm then mixing some brown in there that was some bloodstone genuine, and this is some, what are you, some other brown, some brown and brown. And I get this dunky green, nice little dunky green. And I am going to. And 
And because it is the yellow stripe is a little bit wet, I get this soft edge between that side and this side. I'm then going to let that dry. And I'm going to do that with my hair dryer. Like it. Mine's a little bit too. Um, actually, let me see if I can. Oh, that's better. Um, so, um, mine's a little bit too greenish. And if I want it more brown, I would just, um, with watercolor, you can put paint on top of paint on top of paint. And so I'm going to come in and make. Uh, Add some brown into this and add some brown in up here. And you see that hard line? I don't want that hard line. So I'm just kind of clean my brush off. And while it's still damp, just stroke along the edge of that. And I just was able to kind of erase and soften that line. Now, I'm going to paint some brown into some of those warts. I'm going to get a little bit of red brown off my palette. And I wiggle it over here, get my brush, get this damp, wiggle it over here. This is a water brush that I have the, oh, has the water inside the handle. I'm not really squeezing it. Just a little bit comes out. And I test my color. And that'll do. And so then, work, here's the work, here's the work, here's the work. I'm happy with just a few more words. Uh, I've got these red brown spots. Uh, let's see if this is looking uh, on one of my screens fairly dark. And I'm going to see if I can um, just make this a little bit brighter. Uh, my final step is um, I'm going to take black and put it and sort of mix up some. I haven't even cleaned off my brush, there's still some brown on it, but that's going to be okay. Mixing up some thicker black. And I am going to put that in around the base. Of some of these um, these warts.
any mark that I put off in here, I want to make these more kind of linear lines if I'm putting some sort of texture lines in and things out here because um, you're looking more a lot sort of it's, it's walking away from it. Whereas on surfaces that are pointing towards me, I can think of them as more sort of blotches that I'm looking down on. So these would be skinnier lines up in here. And I'm trying to make this sort of a consistently inconsistent line as my brush comes along. And I'm letting my, I'll just sort of dance that out here. It's sort of, sort of a, a little line that is going to be broken in some places and just sort of makes a little bit of an irregular pattern. There's a little bounce in my hand. Lines in here because it's looking more away from it. In this area, there are more sort of the dark spots would be more of a blotch. So lines up here because it's rocking away from it. In this area down here, you're looking down more blotches. Then I am going to um, make that top just a little bit. So I have here a white prism color pencil to make sure everybody's dry. I'm going to get a consistent light direction. So light will be coming in from this surface. So this edge of this bump is going to be in shadow. In fact, let me put in, I grab a little bit of purpley brown in here and just put in a little bit of shadow along this edge of the prism. Just to make them pop up a little bit more. But the opposite edge, that's where the light is going to be starting. And again, it's sort of consistently inconsistent. I'm going touch, 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 bouncy with my pencil um, so that you sort of feel like you know, there are these little bumps on the skin that we're picking up. Bumps oh, get a little highlight on. And I can also put a few other little kind of regular lighter spots in the skin for this little micro bumps on the side of it. So I'm going dot 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 dot. I won't do it so much towards the side that's more in shade, but it's sort of an area I can get a little bit of little white lines in there. It gives you just a little bit of touch. I want that to be higher contrast, I can use a gel pen, which allows me to write white lines on top of the dark surface. And so some of these are going to get a few, just kind of little. I think I 
It's giving a little bit of reflected light with my non photo blue pencil out here. And there's, there's a little bit of toady texture. Get the sense of these little bumps sticking up through that skin. There's a spade foot toad, vertical pupil on this species. So looking at the shape of the pupil is going to be um, very useful for you in getting your, your, your species to look right. So look at, um, you know, here more of a, let's go back to this guy, very horizontal pupil. Um, and you see the same thing going on here. Notice that little, let's take a look, a closer look at that eye though. Yeah, let's do a little froggy eye. Make that sort of be our last thing. And um, just because frog and toad eyes, there's, there's some really beautiful, beautiful eyes. Um, so let's say, well, let's, let's work this one here. Let's say that this one has this big horizontal pupil. I want to show you a, a sort of a pattern that you will often see on these critter eyes. Um, I'm going to start with uh, some yellow. And I'm going to put that right around the edge of the eye. Down. And it's going to then on uh, this one, it's going to blend into some ochre color. I wanted to see if I can get I know, up around the, uh, the edge of that eye. Brighter, darker. So I've got this color transition that is going that ends on the outside edge as this bright, bright little ring. Then I'm going to take black once that's dry. I have to make sure it's nice and dry. And um, many, uh, many, many frogs will just sort of bounce through another picture of one here. Um, there are um, there are cool patterns in those eyes. So I am going to. Keeping my mind on that, I'm drawing something that is rounded out here. So this is rounding. And what is in this would be coming straight from that. Most focused binoculars are great for frogging. And then I am going to paint this inside part.
no kind of sense of shape of the acoustic system. You want to look at your thing. I let it go. I think we're done. Oh no. There's one last critical step. You know what it is. You want to make this eye sparkle. That's going to be fun. So I can do that with wash. Um, I could also do that with my gel pen. I grab my gel pen here. And I like to put the highlight. I think like if the light's coming in from this direction, I can make a highlight up in here. I could make that up in here. Let me make that up in here. But notice if I put the highlight there, it feels like it could be a white spot on this outer ring. That's not what I want. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this cross the boundary between the iris and the pupil. You notice I'm getting a little bit of dark pink mixed up with my gel pen. I want that to be really bright, so I'm getting rid of more, make sure my gel pen is nice and clean. Hit that with a couple of strokes, then let it dry. So a few strokes of gel pen later, I've got a little white spot on top of my eye. I can also put in a little bit of reflected light down here with my non photo blue pencil. Hard to see on the screen again. And we have a wet frog eye. So that is a little bit about drawing frogs and toads. I like that S shaped leg that, again, you've got your thigh, you've got your calf, you've then got the instep wrapping around in the foot. So remembering that full S gives you that, that funky shape that the frog has in their, their back. Oh, and I should have mentioned this earlier because there's just, I wanna show you my favorite view. When you get a chance to see, to draw this view of a frog, take advantage of it because it's really, 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 really fun. And it's, um, let's just bounce over here one more time. My favorite little frog moment is when they are, oh, you know, the, the, I'll, I'll show you, I'm, I'm gonna do, rather than show you my drawing of it, I am going to bring out, walk across the room here. Um, and I, find the book that I wanted to show you. You'd think that by now I would have my room a little bit more organized. Um, well, some other time. Lars Janssen <laughs> uh, did a wonderful, wonderful drawing of a, a frog from this view. It's one of my, my, my favorite little kind of froggy moments. But what, what I love sort of seeing is when there's just like a little bit of frog head sticking out of the water and um so you'll get you know these little bullfrog moments where they're the, just these <laughs> these little <laughs> these little heads sticking up 
And sometimes they also do really cool things with their reflections. So you'll get this reflected head here. Like if that's all you see of your frog, that's such that's such a great frog moment. Those are really fun. So take it, you know, turtles, you'll see like the tips of their little turtle faces sticking up. Don't think like you need the frog in this position in order to draw it. Um, take advantage of whatever little moments the amphibians give you and, and have some fun with that. Again, close focus binoculars, geek out on their eyes. There we go. Um, hey, Susan, is it all right if I bring you on to talk a little bit about what you're doing with the, the frog calls? Um, add you into the spotlight. Good to see you, and you can now unmute. Hi, um, I don't want you to get too excited. It's I, I'm I'm just learning frog songs, but uh, this is really really great. Uh, and actually, uh, I have not put in my journal yet, but I'm going to draw some basically some photos that I thought of. That cool oh frog. yeah, see, there's <laughs> frogs. <laughs> I, I don't I use the binoculars yes. yet, but this was this was from a camera. They were way far away, but uh, yeah. So I'm going to. I, I love that, that view the, 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 the just. I also, um, I you know, it's fun to draw if you're in a place with alligators or crocodiles. Mm -hmm. Crocodiles really don't get too near the water, um, and and that that view of just the part that is sticking up, um, the 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 tip of the frog iceberg. Yeah, very cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, you were asking about, about the frog call thing. So the thing is, I'm I'm um signed up to volunteer at the Albany Pine Bush, which is our local preserve. I do some volunteer, I've done some volunteer stuff there, uh, for this frog watch um project, which I think is actually like a nationwide or maybe worldwide thing. I mean, people do it all over. Um, but you go out to various like vernal pools and ponds and wetlands and all kinds of things like that at night and you listen for frog songs and you record all the metadata, there's a website, you record all the metadata and everything and you record which species you heard and what the intensity of the calls were and much of their information. And so they're using this to track, you know, where various species of frogs are found. So the Albany Pine Bush has the whole project set up for this where they do like the training and everything that they, they do for this. And you gotta get certified, which means basically having a woman who's the ecologist there Gives you a quiz on frog calls and you learn them. So I'm trying to learn my local frog songs, uh, and I've been and I've been wanting to like make a little cheat sheet for myself in my nature journal um, of what you know what 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 can I how can I identify those calls when I hear them because it's, it's, it's at night you can't see them they're all singing all together. I've already gone out a couple times. I haven't I haven't actually started officially doing this, but I've been out a couple times to some vernal pools during the day, and I've been hearing. <laughs> like lots of frog frog songs which is very delightful and and, and uh you know really feels like spring it's great but yeah so i'm trying i'm trying to like figure out how can i like notate the songs of the frogs in a way that i'll recognize when i hear them because obviously i can't play a recording on my phone while i'm out there i don't want to scare off the frogs yeah. you know or make them think that i'm a frog that they need to like, cover oh, oh yeah there's there's heisenberg and certain things I, you know, for you if you start that yeah, they're, they're having plenty of fun times all on their own. I don't, they don't need me. Um, yeah, so I was just kind of playing around. I I'm, I'm, have not uh, like done it yet, but I was playing around with the, um, the ones I can definitely identify are the spring peepers. Because they're, they're I, I think that they're pretty widespread, aren't they? I'm not a picture. So yeah, but they, but they do the peep, 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 but they're all coming from all different directions all at once and they're overlapping and everything. So I was trying to figure out how can I like, Notate. I can rec I can recognize those ones enough that I don't know that I need the notes, but it'd be fun. So I'm trying to figure how can I like capture the the idea that there are these like overlapping peeps that all are coming from different directions. And oh, so I don't really I know. Love and they keep, what they you're thinking up, about. So yeah, you're showing louder. Kind of yeah, directionality of these things with these uh with the with the with the fades and the. And and the perspective on the letters makes them feel like they're coming from further away. Yeah, I was um, trying to get actually the fact that they, they kind of go, they, they they get louder as they you know as it's sort of beep, kind of it can't be too loud. I've got somebody in the room who's uh, doing a work. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, so I'm trying to figure out, but then a lot of the other ones are difficult. Um, if you'd like, I'll put a, there's a website that the, the lady who um, I did the training um, basically sort of took us to and said, this, this has got all of the different calls of all the frogs. There are 10 species on the website. I'm sorry, there are 12 on the website and 10 of them are actually local to our area and we had to learn them. Um, uh, and I will check and put in the chat. Um, but it's got all of the uh, recordings of all of the, the songs, um, which is honestly kind of impressive because um, uh, every time I've been hearing them, I've been hearing multiple species all at once. I don't know how they managed to record just one species at a time. Um, <laughs> Yeah. But uh, yeah, so it's really cool. But the thing is, is that there's there's several frogs that all have sort of different variations on a sort of a trill kind of sound. And I can tell the difference when I'm listening to them on this site, but it's been really difficult. I was out at the pond um, a couple afternoons ago and there were all the spring peepers. They were very loud. And then under that, there was somebody who was doing this kind of trill sound that I'm not quite, I haven't quite figured out which one it is yet. So I'm really trying to like practice and learn. Oh, that, that is so much fun. I remember when yeah. I was a Boy Scout in uh, getting the, the, uh, the reptile study merit badge. Um, <laughs> we went out on listening to frogs while in reptile study. <laughs> no, I anyway, um, but we, yeah, we did this night hike listening for frogs and um i still remember being there down by the creek with jack kilmartin listening for the frogs and it's a wonderful wonderful experience yeah you can tell all these different species apart could we see your cheat sheet oh well i haven't i haven't made the cheat sheet yet oh you haven't made the cheat sheet yet. okay <laughs> so yeah share that them when you get that I notate the sound so so now i've got some now i've got some tips on how to draw them which is great because i can kind of go from here's my um, drawing from today, yep. but uh, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm uh, one general thing to think about yeah. is, um, you know, when uh, an EMT or a nurse takes your pulse, they're not just counting the beats, they're listening and they're, they're, they're feeling for the rate, the rhythm and the quality. Hmm. So um, the, the rate, what is your beats per minute, minutes? The rhythm, is this per, does this person have a regular heartbeat or an irregular heartbeat? So what is the, um, uh, what is the pattern of these? And the quality is more of a subjective, like how does this feel to you? Is it, uh, you know, a bounding pulse uh, is it they, what they call a thready pulse, which is you sort of like imagine a little knot pulled on, on a string being kind of pulled through there. You feel this little kind of eh, eh, eh. So um, by- That's like one of those things that you can't like, you can't just like teach somebody, you just had to like listen to it enough to be able to get to know what it should sound like and how it's different, right? Yeah, so for, I like to think of when I'm, say listening to a, a, a critter like this, okay, the rate, rhythm and quality, mm. I can use this. So um, rate, you know, you know, how many, what is the timing of these? Is this a, like a bullfrog, like boom, um, That was great. Um, I would listen to bullfrogs on that website. That sounds exactly like it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, you know, or is it the, the you know, uh, the, the Pacific chorus frog is doing a faster one with a, you know, ran it, 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 ran it. Oh, by the way, Pacific chorus frogs, this is for everybody on this call, even you vaulters over there. Um, you've got to learn the, um, the song of the Pacific chorus frog because it then becomes really fun to split, to play spot the chorus frog on Hollywood movies. Because no matter where the people are supposed to be, they constantly, like anytime there's in a movie and like a, a hawk or an eagle flies by, they play a red-tailed hawk call in Hollywood. They always dub in, you know, cue the red-tailed hawk. There's actually even a nature special that started with this bald eagle flying along and opens its mouth, does a red-tailed hawk call. And the, uh, but the, the Pacific chorus frog, it's this little tiny, that also like your spring peeper, kind of they, they, they get in the club and they all do it together. You know, every time you want it to sort of feel like, oh, it's nighttime somewhere in the, the tropical forest, right? 
and here's the Pacific Chorus Frog. You know, they're on the moon of Endor. They're on the, you know, basically everywhere. Um, oh, Kate is saying the same thing about the loon. Yeah. Oh, it's nighttime noise. Like, you're well, not I even in loon habitat, but we're going to play the loon noise because it sounds like a thing that's out at night. Well, that, um, that, that, that's why we say that frogs say ribbit, ribbit isn't it like that's why yeah, yeah because of the, the, the Pacific chorus frog does a ribbit frog. <laughs> it does this this two like, dee, 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 right and others don't <laughs> um but yeah they, they 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 stick that that into to, to everywhere um so um a couple of things that you can do um is you can make yourself just a little you know if if it is if it's a do 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 you can make a line that comes do, 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 right? And um, if, um, you know, it's just something kind of loud and, uh, you know, you can also, you can add words to this, you know, this could be uh, ribbit, ribbit. So you see, I'm, I'm, the words go down, the words go up, right? So your words can go up and down, your little marks can go up and down. Like if it's getting louder, you can have um, something that gets wider or darker, you know? Or I like what you did. Uh, that's why I wrote this down because I didn't want to forget your little trick here of the word is getting bolder and bigger. You know, that's a great way of showing volume in there. And then, um, so the, and then what you want to also do is like, let's say the next peep is here. Um, what is the time interval between these? What is the time interval that you're looking at? So um, is this, um, you know, that uh, every two seconds they're doing this, or is this um, with a Pacific chorus frog, one second would be kind of like that. So they're just going, <laughs> And the, so that gives you sort of rate, rhythm, and for quality, you know, is it mechanical? Is it musical? Is it chirpy? Is it wooden? Is it croaking? Is it bird-like? Is it, you know, whatever modifiers you want to bring to the table to describe that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the kind of, thinking about the rate, the rhythm, and the quality is a, a really useful. Also, for I do the same thing for bird calls. Ah, mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really good. Excellent. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. Hopefully, like, next time I'll, I'll hopefully I'll have a little cheat sheet I'll put together, hopefully. Oh, that, that, we, we, we definitely want to see your cheat sheet. Okay, well, I'll let um, you, yeah. Now we're getting, I, and I, I wish, uh, and amphibians are something we really need to monitor. Amphibian populations are in a wild decline worldwide. There's, we are, there's, there's currently a, a, a mass frog extinction going on. Um, and it is, it's really, really disturbing. Um, um, the there's a, a fungus, the chytrid fungus, that is um, that, that 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 hammers the, the the little frogs. That has blasted frogs throughout the Sierra and worldwide. Um, but also, frogs, amphibians are, are really sensitive bioindicators. They absorb nasty chemicals in the water. We put nasty chemicals in the water. It's going right into our little amphibian buddies. Um, and, uh, 
And so I'm glad you're involved doing citizen science monitoring that. That's that's very, very helpful. Okay. Somebody else described described this, this whole thing. Like they have a number of different citizen science events. And basically, like, so Dylan is the name of the woman who, who runs a lot of these. And basically, we go and count whatever Dylan wants us to count. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. This yeah, it, it, it also, a lot of them depend on on these these vernal pools and things. And if you if you build a housing development there, or you or the water flow changes in that area or something, no more vernal pool. What are they going to do? Yeah. You know? So yeah, it's just ugh. yeah, spade foot toads. You wouldn't know they're there. You just add water. They're spade foot toads. That's what you would say. Yeah. Hopefully, I don't know. If that's on my list. I'm going to learn them. They're, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know if we'll, I don't know if I'll hear him this year. But yeah, it's yeah. healthy meadows. Yes. And and Chadwick from Point Blue Conservation Science says, yeah, healthy meadows. Um, it's really important that we we're 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 taking care of those systems. Mm -hmm. um, hey, uh, Susan, thank you so much. Thank thank you thank you. This is really good tips. So I'm gonna get to work. <laughs> Have fun. Um, let's uh, throw this open to the community here. If anybody has any um, frog uh, amphibian anecdotes uh, or pages to share um, or other journaly moments, um, we would love to hear from you. Let's start with Shannon. Um, and I'm gonna add you into the spotlight. Hi there, Shannon. And you can now unmute. There, it's hard to see the sun's just bright right now. <laughs> we, but we, we see you very well. Good, okay, well, thank you so much for today. That really fleshed out some of what I shared last week about the coqui frog and listening deeply into their song and trying to, you know, kind of hear beneath the cacophony of noise. So I really appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, well, and, and maybe just say a little bit, uh, I know you, you, you described this last time, but you actually had some incredible insights about deep listening. Um, and I want people, as, as you listen to Shannon describe this, um, think about just, the, the, this is it's, it's essentially, you, you, maybe you've done the meditation where you eat an orange slowly. I, I feel like you're doing that with your ears and just going deeper and deeper and deeper. Could, could you describe your process and your insight for people? Mm, well, I'll try. Uh, I have a background in music, so I was bringing my musical background to the experience of listening to the frogs. Uh, and as I said last week, that it was just so loud and so noisy, I, I couldn't really sleep. <laughs> So my antidote was to just meditate into them you use, using your word there. And that really is kind of what it is where you just start listening and you listen and you catch you know, a first layer and then you listen farther and then you catch a second layer and then even deeper and you catch all these different layers until eventually you start to hear, in my case anyway, I began to hear like melodies happening um, among the the interplay, it was interplay of the different uh, saw, uh, frogs seeing all at the same time. And your words that I wrote down over here, rate, rhythm, quality, are really what comes into that. Uh, I didn't pay attention to the rate, um, but the rhythm at a certain layer of listening deep and deep and deep, I did describe last week that I began to catch uh, a universal rhythm within the chorus and the universal rhythm, uh, you know, then I tried to identify from my storehouse of whatever background in music I had, if there was a correlation to something that I already knew about. And so, as I said, I began to hear what appeared to be sort of jazz rhythms in their music <laughs> and i call it music because yeah. i did i did identify the intervals you know in music you have do re mi fa so la ti do and so the the coqui frog does from do to t so it's a seven if you're counting the the like the the levels of the scale so that would be a seventh an octave is 
doe to doe. They didn't do a full octave, they do a seventh almost always. Occasionally I thought I heard a fifth, but I wasn't sure, you know, so those last three, fifth, sixth, and sevenths are little, you know, That's you have to really cool. have a tuned ear for that. But that, you know, kind of opens up a whole other level. Of course, it's used in birding to, you know, listen to bird songs, but, you know, in general, in nature, do we always really listen to the sounds of nature and, and, and make connections uh, you know, to our experience of our world or, you know, just discover new things about the sounds in nature. Uh, I'll give another different, way different example, which would be, I think we're coming to the close of what's called the worm moon. And the first time <laughs> uh, I happened to be walking through a park that's a, kind of an unused park and it was a big, a big green, you know, area. And it was early early spring and I was walking through there and I kept hearing this strange noise all around me, all everywhere. And, um, and, and then suddenly it was like a boom. It's the worms. It's the sound of the worms working in the ground, digging and waking up and beginning to, you know, process stuff in the ground. <laughs> it was truly, truly cool. So, um, and it, it will remain one of those key experiences uh, in my life, long life as it's been now. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, so, you know, I would really encourage, and I think that's just fantastic, uh, being a part of a citizen science exploration into the frog world. I'm here where there's not a lot of, it, at least so far, I haven't discovered a lot of uh, frogs. There are lots of amphibians and boy, do they have a strange way of living. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's wonderful to me, well, before I shift subject or go back to frogs and, and toads and things like that, as you've presented does that help to explain a little oh, bit it, about it does thing? it does that's and i love how you're, you're taking your prior knowledge and layering it into this and really being deliberate about what does this remind me of what is in the in my experience and that just makes it resonate personally with you more and also you can then use that expertise that you've developed in music to analyze this the sound like the idea that you're figuring out that oh that this is a seventh i mean that's that is that's a cool superpower that's really really neat that you've developed your ear to be able to detect that i i think that's that's exciting i i thought so too at the time i mean it was and as i said about the worms it wasn't really layering my past experiences it was an instantaneous like boom it's the worms you know, and I'd never really noticed worm noise before <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I like if if I, I think that that is you know uh, George Washington Carver said that if you love anything enough, anything will speak to you. And um, you you just had to listen deeply enough to hear that 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 song of the earth. That is that's beautiful. Yes. Yeah. That's that is that's one. Of, it's the book of nature, learning how to recognize uh, all of the you know uh, language of the world of nature around us. It's really important to me, and you know my life has been something I've always uh, spent time uh, doing. Uh, so yeah, it, it's a helpful guide for anybody doing what they're doing. That's great. Yeah, yeah. And, but then to flip back quickly, and I don't know if you can see this, I really don't know because it's just on my cell phone. Um, let so me that... reduce my screen for just a moment and um, it'll make you larger. Yeah, it's so dark. I just don't know that you can see it, but you can see a weird shape, right? Uh, yeah, sort of a heart-shaped form and with fern-like forms around the outside. That's right. Okay, so this is a pond here and it's covered with these beautiful little teeny tiny leaves all over it, which I haven't tried to draw yet and I haven't tried to find out what they are. Uh, but one day I was walking past um, the pond 
and there was this little shape in there and I had to look really closely and here a frog had come up and the little leaf was sitting right on its head, Ugh. you know, because it came up through the leaves. And so there's a leaf on that picture that you can't see, just stretched right across his forehead. And oh, his, his, his little eyes are there it's up from the top. And I guess I'm, I'm saying this is a frog, but it could be a toad because it looks like it has those big poison sacks that you were talking about. Um, so I don't know, but you know, hopefully I'll see him again and I'll get a chance to sketch him. And then uh, during the week, I also, uh, as I was harvesting a bunch of grass, came across a, um, a toad oh. that I tried to sketch as best I could yeah. uh, without your, your good expertise to help guide. This is from the top and he was definitely a toad and almost what I would call a horny toad because he had those crests that you drew on the frog. Yeah. They were very pronounced and, and dinosaur-like. Uh, mm. <laughs> so that was my attempt at capturing, oh, that's fun. capturing him. And then a little bit closer up down here. And look at those, those, those hands turned inward. Yes, 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 yes. And these sacks. I yep. didn't know what that was. Glass. When I, and of course, I never touch these things with my bare hands as I'm out here in the territory that I'm not that familiar with. I've always had my gloves on. So I did catch him in my hands and, and his underside was absolutely stunningly beautiful. It was just that beautiful buff color, but then these lovely designs all over his tummy side. So, um, and I, I catch and release, I don't, you know, yeah. try to hurt anything. So, you know, I did put him in a jar and I tried to study him from all different angles and tried to sketch yeah. him, you know, live and so on. And I did take pictures so I could work with it later. Uh, but when I heard that you were doing frogs today, I was like, oh, perfect. Oh, good. Yep. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. So, yeah. So anyway, that's, I mean, out here, there's all kinds of critters that uh, are amphibians that geckos we found a gecko egg nest the other day uh and so i you can't see them but there are a couple of little white eggs in this jar Whoa. that i wanted to put under my magnifying glass it's not a very strong magnifying glass like oh. just buy whatever you know five ma magnification but i thought i might be able to see a little more closely they're very smooth to look at they look like itsy bitsy bird eggs uh, and but that's sometimes cool. they that's have really whole, neat. Yeah, sometimes they have a whole pattern though in the eggs. Uh, if you can get close enough to see the surface, the surface of the egg, uh, and so geckos and lizards and frogs and toads and you know just all kinds of critters, uh, skinks, what they call skinks, yeah. and and, and the geckos bark. I haven't necessarily heard them bark yet i have yeah, I, seen I mean, each other <clears throat> geckos can, can make this, this this surprisingly loud pop noise aha <laughs> uh aha -huh, uh -huh. well yeah. i'll have to listen for that because they're everywhere here they're all over the place so oh, i watch fun. them drop their tails and start growing new tails and there's a color change between yep. uh the green part uh and the tail it changes color and then it falls off and then a teeny tiny little sprouty tail pokes out. <laughs> it's so cute. So anyway, I like them all. And, uh, and this is just wonderful to have your guidance along the way with all of this and, and all the sharings that we get from everybody. It's really, really a special thing. Thank you. Yeah, um, you know, there's, a, there's a, a, a bunch of chatter in the chat. Um, about uh, wondering if you'd be interested in working with us to, to kind of put together a little workshop on your thoughts of listening to the music in nature. Oh, well, I'd, I'd love to share what, what I can, can. I don't know if it'll be very impressive, but I would, I would certainly love to put some effort into preparing that. Um, could, could you shoot me an email after this, this workshop and then we'll be in touch and we can make that happen. That was a great idea, Ivea. Oh, uh, thank you, Barry. Yeah. All right. Sure. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye-bye. That'll be fun. <laughs> um, 
Al, let me take a look at the gallery. Um, Jack's got something to share. Hey there, Jack, how are you doing? You can add in the spotlight and you can now unmute. Hey, <clears throat> so I did a, um, you only stayed for like 10 seconds. So I did a super quick step sketch, but I made, I did this little sketch of a morning dove because I had this really funny question. His, it was a really windy cold day yesterday. So I'm, and he had his feathers fluffed up over his feet so you couldn't see them. So I asked, um, feathers fluffed over feet, is his or her feet cold? <laughs> oh, oh, let me it's remove my spot. Oh yeah, looking, yeah. He's looking away, but. I basically just did that to ask that funny question. Is this feet cold? Nice. So you're getting just the, the, the shape, the posture of this. You're also not making an assumption about whether it's male or female. I like uh, you know, all of those aspects of these notes here. Um, that's really cool. And I never really knew this. Um, also yesterday, I, I just wrote about it, but... Um, there were a big group of birds out in our yard, just like a big group. And they, they all seemed black from a distance from our house. But when I got on my binoculars and looked at um, like all the different, um, all, all the birds, there's like four or five different types of birds that were there. Um, there was a few male red-winged blackbirds and lots of females, a couple male brown-headed cowbirds and some European starlings. And there were also um, robins, but when that big group flew away, it was mostly, the group was mostly um, female red-winged blackbirds, but with all, with those other species thrown in. Um, and the um, robins that were on the ground, they were also, they stayed behind for some reason. They didn't, they didn't go with the, um, with the group. And um, there was also a woodpecker with the um, robins. So was the woodpecker on the ground? He was kind of like, I only saw him once. He did go onto the ground next to a robin in the mulch, but then he kind of went back up into the tree. Uh, flickers, you'll often see flickers come down and hunt on the ground. They're a, a very terrestrial woodpecker. Sometimes you see them up in the tree, but also very often they'll be hunting down there on the ground. I wonder if that yeah. could have been a flicker. I um, don't, it might have been. Like, I know there's a lot of shafts, different kind of shafts of flickers, like yellow shafted. Yeah. Um, and then I also had, um, there were all these little like weed things going and I'm wondering if they were those little whirligigs. Um, so I pulled one up so I could get the roots and everything. And they're just weeds, so it's not like I was just ripping up. But I did a little ooh, bit on that. Ooh, hold on one moment. I'm going to make my screen small, hints of spring. Oh, wow. Oh, this is fun. This is fun. So you've got, a cross section of the stem around there. Oh, oh yes. So you've got the cotyledons coming up and then the true leaves popping up inside those. So the first little sprout comes up and it sends up these two little platforms, these two little solar collector platforms that aren't the official leaves. And then the real leaves come up through that. And those first ones are called cotyledons and you've got these yeah, you are out there just at the front edge of the of of, of spring springing. This is so cool. Why is yeah? Why are the you, on many species we we see that the 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 stems close to the um, ground are purple and and pink, and I don't know why that is either. That's really an interesting observation. Yeah, um, and we're also, I, I know um, about the true leaves because we're also, um, it's kind of funny what happens every year with our garden. We've got like, um, we start our seeds indoors and we've got lots of sprouts, zucchini and tomatoes and oregano and herbs. But um, it's kind of funny what happens to our garden every year. Like last year, we didn't um, really know, but we added a ton of compost to the garden boxes and it was way too much nitrogen. So like nothing grew. And- oh. Two years ago, we um, on vacation they got fried because it was so hot that year. Oh yeah, it's and, what? How how cool is it to also have that process of trying to grow those things to help to make you kind of aware of things such as like, what's the nitrogen level here in our plants? That's cool. Yeah, and 
And uh -huh. I also just want to go back to that interesting observation. The uh, brown and head cowbirds, the red winged blackbirds, and also the starlings, right? Um, all uh, those ones took off together in a group, but the robins left, stayed behind. Um, it make, makes me think about sort of the difference in sort of the flocking tendency and behavior of those different species. That's, that's a very interesting observation, this mix of birds and then something happens and the robins are just like, yeah, we're cool with this. And um, also kind of interesting, the robins were more spread out. All the other birds were like condensed into one group. The robins were spread out and avoided the group. So like the group of the cowbirds and all of them, um, they were in a more compacted group. And then the robins were more wow. spread out and avoided that group. That's really interesting. So it make, that makes me think like, I, here's some, some I wonders that like, I wonder if when you're in a tight group, if competition for food is higher, but predator safety, um, you're, but you're more safe from predators. I wonder if there's a balance between, um, you know, how close you want to be to, to, to other ones and, um, you know, do, do you want to be foraging on your own, get more chow? Do you want to be kind of have all the eyes of all your friends also looking out for the predators around you? That's an interesting trade off. Yeah, there were, um, I also noticed that it wasn't like after observing them for a while, there wasn't that much fighting. It seemed like everybody was kind of like in their own little tiny space pecking for worms. Although I did see a couple red winged blackbirds kind of jumping up at each other and um, with they're like like that um, at each other. But at all the females, um, like the blackbird, the female red winged blackbirds, they were just kind of they had their little space and they were looking for worms there. Oh, that's neat. Huh. Th those are are great ethology observation. So again, ethology is the study of behavior. And so you're not just looking at how things look, but you're noticing interactions between species. So you're thinking like an ecologist. You are noticing the distances between things. You're noticing grouping and spacing. I am really impressed at the the variety of things that you're noticing. Um, you got a lot of people, they're just, they would kind of come up with, here's a list of the birds that I saw. And that's the end of the story. But you went so much deeper than that. I, that's, that's a really cool set of observations. I wonder if having that in mind and kind of looking for more versions of that, what you're going to notice. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. Um, let's see what's going on with Kate. Um, uh, let's see. And I am going to huh. okay, oh, I see what now I can get you. Uh, add you into the spotlight. Oh, um, also, uh, Kate, there's something. Um, uh, an interesting opportunity that I wanted to talk to you about offline post show, give me a call. You can find my web telephone number on the website. Okay. Um, yeah, I saw the message on Instagram. I was about to send you an email after class. Okay. But, yeah, really yeah give, give, give me a call and we'll, 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 we'll strategize. Okay. Um, let's see. This week I've just been, I haven't done a lot big painting wise, but. I can always find where I left off my sketchbook by looking at like the last class we did. So there's the finches from last week. Yeah. Um, but since I've just been doing a lot of kind of posture drawing and stuff, um, one of the things I was working on is my grandma's birthday was recently and she had, she has goats and she had a very beloved goat pass away in the last year. So I figured I'd do a portrait for her. Um, so I can teach myself how to draw goats. When I looked it up online, how to draw goats, the main thing that came up on YouTube was how to draw blood for veterinary examinations. 
which useful information, but not <laughs> entirely relevant. So I kind of taught myself the anatomy and did some posture studies. And then from there, I went into drawing the individual. And then I looked oh, at- Oh, and now you're doing a deep dive under the skin. Oh, check you out. Yeah. And then for the, well, this is the first draft of that portrait, but- um, oh, oh, oh. oh, that is so sweet. That yeah. is so sweet. I love the little goat eyes with those horizontal pupils. Aren't they Aren't strange? strange? I mean, I was trying to think of how to draw goats because, you know, they're kind of like deer, but not entirely. And they're sort of like a dog, a deer, <laughs> and an alien of some sort. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're oh, and also the, um, the, the idea of, of, of drawing a goat and taking a goat break um, uh, in one of our uh, Wild Wonders, uh, the wonderful artist Mark Simmons, who is a, a delightful artist, but also just hilarious to listen to, um, uh, sort of had this this thing about kind of taking a goat break and and drawing uh, goats. Um, so that also kind of the, just the idea of 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 a goat break um, has sort of in, among a lot of folks in the Nature Journal community has become this sort of inside joke that I want to. Uh, uh that, that you're now officially in on um and uh I, I i those those goat studies are terrific it's amazing how when you do a bunch of things like that you understand just sort of how those beasties are put together um in such a different way yeah i feel like the key to it is first looking at how everything internally works like where the joints are and then from there working with exterior lines and just trying to figure out like what they look like from different angles and just those dances and doing the quick sketches and then coming in and doing more detailed ones. But they're so funny because they've all the fluff in weird places, their beards and their weird little eyes and Yoda ears and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. And also are those dogwood um, around the outside edge of it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to figure out what to do because it's a very light colored goat. Yeah. And I want to do a lighter background, which I may change that up. I think I'm going to do another draft of this where I've got something darker in the back. But um, yeah. Oh, that's lovely. I, I have a soft spot for dogwood. I that's really it. fun. <laughs> yeah. I also did, um, I just went on Bird Pixel and maybe it was Instagram or Pinterest. I forget what it was, but I just went through and just did a bunch of little sketches of birds really fast to just kind of build up my ability to draw birds quickly because I know in the field um, you get such a short window of time to draw things yeah. so I if I can kind yeah. of replicate that at home and just really learn how to draw things quickly um, well there's a cat that got in there but you know <laughs> sometimes um, a cat shows up yeah I, I sort of your your shorebird studies I was actually thinking about that the other day oh, I, love um, I was out and I bumped into a killdeer and was making a few sketches of the killdeer and its head was just not looking at all like a killdeer and I thought to myself I should make a page of killdeer studies like Kate does and that would it really helps doesn't it yeah 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 so I'm going back and forth between drawing like people and doing the same like studies like I do for birds and then jumping back to doing birds uh, kind of took cross training Ray Bonto there and did oh some Pigeon for um, Ray Bonto. Let's see. Did some more historical study stuff. It's kind uh, of funny. I'll get into drawing people and then go, oh, that looks off. But um, also more shorebirds. And ooh, some other look at that stuff. plover up there. Yeah, I'm trying to get more. Yeah, and also, uh, wait, hold, like, hold this up. This Your line variation is just so, uh, so useful I, it, it it just gives these very much like uh john busby um, i've really been working on trying to learn how to use like my pencils a bit better because i feel like once i have a good control of being able to do good marksmanship kind of like well not with shooting but with yeah. creating the different marks that really connotate like form then it'll transfer over into just drawing anything so um doing that and then I did a study where I tried to teach myself how to draw pheasants because um, it seemed like a really good opportunity to learn how to 
um, do iridescence and to use mm -hmm. um, marks on like natural markings to show volume. Um, yeah, nice job sort of wrapping those curved bars around the body there. Yeah, it kind of shows the texture too because those individual feathers like create this little lump almost. Um, yeah, it's not super busy week art wise. Did kind of the page where I did just loons from Bird Pixel, and I just went through and drew whatever kind of caught my eye. And so that's kind of it. Last thing I did was yesterday I was doing saddle fitting with someone. And we were trying to figure out why this horse was having a problem where we get a sore at the base of its shoulder. And mm -hmm. so we were looking at these different pads um, and saddles. We we're looking at the angles at which you put pressure on something and where it would create that pressure point. So then I made a diagram for the horse's owner to explain to her why the custom pad that she got was actually causing her horse quite a bit of pain. Um, oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, kind of, like, this, this reminds me, this is very easy. Da Vinci, very Da Vinci, sort of the way you're thinking these ideas through on paper, where there's also kind of an underlying understanding of anatomy, and then you're diagramming another idea on top of that. Um, uh, that's so cool. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I've been trying to do anything that um, I'm trying to learn about and just try and do the visual learning where I kind of pull it apart. Um, like this, what I was looking at was, I was working with someone who had a lot more knowledge than me and was trying to just absorb that as much as possible. What we we're talking about is how, if you look at the angle of how the pad is set um, to the relation of like the horse's withers and where they move and plus where you can safely have them bear weight. Uh, we are looking at is this one had a really steep angle right at the shoulder. So what would happen is you put pressure on it and it would create this little pressure point right at the base of the shoulder. Whereas you have one that has a shallower angle that uh, makes contact farther back, you get a wider angle of the shoulder that allows more movement and less friction. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. That's really cool. So that's all I got for this week, but. That's, yeah. this is good. This is good work, Kate. Hey, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Great to see you. TV call after this. Uh, here we go. Um, let me take a look over in the. Uh, I'll take a look over in. Uh, I see Ray Bonto has got uh, some cool stuff to share with us. Um, hey there, it's great to see you. You can now safely unmute. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I had a bit of a problem because I didn't leave the paint to dry, so I had to lift oh, it. Oh, yeah. So they all started to kind of blend into each other. Yeah. So I had to lift it out again and start. And then we're all fine. But. Oh, nice. Nice. Uh, I, I like this. This feels very structural. Um, it feels like a really solid frog that you're you're seeing three um, three dimensions um, uh, in this in this frog. So really nice visualization. Thank you. Here's a skeleton. Oh, you're drawing the skeleton and the little toady face. Oh, this is great, great. Yes, 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 yes. Now look at the, oh. Love it. That's really fun. That's really fun. And it, and you kind of get the sense that it it has volume. You can you can feel the eye curving um, away from you in this space, and then the the sphere of the eye fitting into these tissues of the head. Nice work. Was that a gouache um, a gouache highlight? Um, I like the way that eye highlight came out. Oh, the Posca. Ah. Um, here are some blossoms. These are the only nature general page I managed to do in the last week. <laughs> but. Oh, wow. It's mostly gouache. 
I can use a bit of Posca and also just a bit of fun grips. Um, uh, and, and it's so much fun to be able to, to push the light values, not just push the dark values. So you first put in the dark and then you're putting the, um, the, the lights on top of that. That's really cool. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Um, the, uh, oh, that was really good to see. Yeah, the toned paper is, I, I really, really like it. Um, if you haven't, folks, had a chance to play with toned paper, if you, I mean, it's fun to put dark on, on a light piece of paper, but you'll discover it's crazy fun to put light on that tone paper with it. And you'll see that your drawing will just get this extra pop. Like on those toads, when we started to hit those little highlights on those bumps, you're kind of like, oh yeah, it looks all warty now. Those, you get to, your, 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 your pencil now is light coming in on your drawing. This and fun to do. Hey, well done. Um, let's bring in Ann Chadwick from Point Blue Conservation Science. Ann, what has been happening in your journal? Hold on a second. Um, I know you can't uh, unmute yet. And for some reason, I always have a hard time. I'm gonna add myself in and then for some reason, then your unmute button shows up really easily. Now you can unmute. There we go. Hi everybody. So I missed last week for a good reason. I got to go to Yosemite. Oh. This is a bunch of personal stuff. So we'll just skip that, but... Um, I went out on a snowshoe walk with the ranger and we listened to a lot of bird songs. We didn't see a lot of the birds, but eventually during yep. the week, a few, and it's a work in progress. I've got a couple more circles to fill in here, but. Um, oh, look at the falls. Too. Yeah, and then I hiked up the mist trail to the top of Nevada Falls. So going up past Vernal Falls, which was fantastic. And um, thank you, Jack, for teaching me how to draw waterfalls. I wouldn't have been as comfortable just sketching this live and, you know, the dark, the dark mm -hmm. rock against the white water. It really pops it. It really pops it, Anne. Oh, that um, was fun. And also, you didn't overwork the stuff inside the waterfall. Everybody starts drawing water lines inside the yeah. waterfall, and it turns the waterfall dark. Oh, look at the valley view. Was this, was this from, uh, the, there's a little pullout. Yeah, they call it tunnel view because it's right when you come through the tunnel. Um, yep, yep. Overlooking the valley and it's where the Ansel Adams shots are from and so on. So I went up kind of early and- okay, Hold on um, a second, well, I'm, I'm gonna grab something for just a sec. Hiked up above the parking lot so I could kind of get away from the people who were jumping out of their car, taking one cell phone picture and leave. In fact, some people didn't get out of their car. They just like held the cell phone up through the- Yes. You know, <laughs> the, the sunroof and took a picture and then drove away. I was like, really? Is that how uh, you do Yosemite? Yeah. Oh, um, well, um, the, the, most, most people who visit national parks do not leave asphalt. Yeah. Yeah, the ranger was saying that. For those of us, there were about 30 of us on the snowshoe hike. And she was saying, congratulations, you got out of your car and off the asphalt. Yeah. <laughs> she but, had but, statistics but, on it. It was amazing. Th this, is, this is really, really interesting. So folks, look at the, the, the tone, the, the, the values that Anne's got here. On El Capitan on the left-hand side, it really just glows bright because... It's adjacent to that dark other rock. And also notice that that rock being really dark um, and the light, that contrast pulls El Capitan, the left-hand side one, into the foreground plane. On Bridal Veil Falls, on the right-hand side, you also see a lot of detail in that part of the drawing and some strong line work. High contrast right around the falls themselves. And that also pulls the, that part, the detail of the line and the high contrast makes it very clear that there's this foreground zone 
that's closer to you and look at how the trees are handled in that there's texture and detail then in the middle ground the trees are just a dark shape no detail it's so it takes such restraint not to drop detail in there and then you're looking back towards half dome and clouds rest getting you know less and progressively less detail back there um this is this is a, a real study in how to show depth on a flat piece of paper. Uh, the other fun thing was at the last minute, I took my eraser and made a little mist coming up at the base of Bridal Veil Falls. And I have to confess, I think Half Dome is too big just because I love it. I just uh, wanted to. I, I do that you know? all the time too. <laughs> If you um, take a photograph, it's not going to be quite that big, but hey, I like it, so I made it big. And yeah, then one oh, more. That's fun. Oh, before you go on from that one, I just want to um, I want to share something from you. This uh, was sitting here. I'm going to add spotlight to. Um, just want to send a shout out <laughs> to Baba Watsi and Baba Robert. Ah, so nice. Same spot. I like that, Jack. So. This was this was uh that's that was when Amelia was uh just a sprout like that. Now she's nine years old. Um and uh yeah, same location. Um and uh yeah. <laughs> Aw, so sweet. Love your drawing. And then one more. Um this was just uh <laughs> going around the valley, different. Oh. Um, oh yes yeah it was so pretty i mean the falls are pretty full and the weather was great it wasn't too crowded it wasn't too smoky although they were doing some controlled burns in the valley floor so a little bit smoky but um just so nice to be back it was great mm, mm, mm. oh it's so nice to be up there and we had fun with titles I, did, I was Yosemite loving your Yosemite, <laughs> the vertical Yosemite. Yeah. All right. Aww. Thank oh, you. That's great. <laughs> and um, yes, you, you, we, we will allow you to go play in national parks. Um, I missed you guys, but it was, it was kind of worth it. It was okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wonderful. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Ah, oh, yeah, now I'm jonesing to, uh, to, uh, to, to go up to Yosemite. My, my parents tried to get up to Yosemite every year of their life. And wow. um, at least for a little while, there's one year where they, they didn't make it and the year was kind of coming to an end. So they, uh, you know, they just, packed everything in the car with no plans and just took off and uh, went and, uh, and splashed in the cold, cold river. And um, mm -hmm. I think the pass was at that point closed so they couldn't get up to Tuolumne Meadows. But uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful place. Just the, the, the foresight to protect that place from development. Um, I'm so grateful for them. Um, thank you, Anne. Lots of fun, thanks. Um, so, um, Susan, hey there. I'm going to add you into the spotlight and you can now unmute. Hello again, I, I had some things to share, but figured I'd finish the talking. Speaking of your, I, it just occurred to, I haven't been to Yosemite since I was, I think like 15, so that would've been, 21 years ago. Um, but it just occurred to me because I have like, like random bits of like art supplies that I've just carried with me to college and then to an apartment. And, and um, it just occurred to me that I have this pad of watercolor paper that I had with me in Yosemite. And I have this half finished painting on watercolor. I think I was using like Crayola watercolors or something. So I had another painting that I, that I made um, that was up on my wall in my bedroom 
back then that is completely faded out to white because Crayola watercolors don't don't last. So, but this one's been in the pad the whole time. So here's my, I, I don't I don't know if this I don't. This was, I think, from, from a combination of photos from a hike that we did. I don't even remember what, what hike it was or whether this is Half Dome or something else, but uh, yeah, so. Oh, that's fun. You know, that was from 21 years ago. How, um, how many years ago? Tw 21, probably. Oh, so, wow. I was 15, which I think yeah. I was. I'm 36 now. I know I don't look 36 because the gray hair, but I'm 36. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's fun. But, uh, so, but, but I want to show you. So, a couple, a couple of things. So, first of all, speaking of frogs, I think, but this was um, sometime last week. I went out to a bit of the Albany Pine Bush, um, just going on a trail where I knew that, that it's sort of a wooded area where there might be morning cloak butterflies. And it was warm enough day that maybe they would be out flying because they hibernate as adults. And so they will actually fly sometimes in winter. But I got out of the car. And I never made it to where the morning cloaks were because I heard the sound of singing. Uh, so followed, followed the sound a bit, moved that way down the road. And there's this little vernal pool just off the road. Oh. Um, and uh, oh, peep, 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 so, so here, peep, here's my first attempt at recording, uh, notating their, their sounds. Oh, this and, is so cool. And nice yeah. job punching in the contrast at that sort of the... Uh, the, the edge of those little clumps and the edge of the yeah that was that was tough and, I, and honestly what I would have liked to do is get the reflection of the tree in there but at, at a certain point I just kind of you know oh just up. But yeah so I basically just there was this like nice tree I was able to lean against and I basically ended up sitting there for like two hours uh, the frogs were only in the very distant part of the pond so I had some binoculars don't have close focus binoculars and I really desperately want them because I love looking at butterflies, but some one of these days, but the binoculars I did have, I was going to see them there. And I also got some photos and so I think I showed you one of the photos before of the, the frogs. Um, man, they were in this very, very distant area. They were just like all hopping around and, and moving around and having, having lots of, lots of froggy fun times, making more frogs for us, which is great. I, I'm pretty sure I even saw some egg nests in there. It was very hard to tell. And it was so overgrown, I really did not even try to get back there because I also got my first tick of the season from, from this, which I did believe. Uh, yeah. But they're yep. tiny this time of year and <laughs> no ticks. Um, but yes, that was really cool. So hopefully I'm going to go back there and once I actually start doing the frog watch surveying, I'll do that. But I was taking some notes. Um, and where else can I ask that I have? Um, so I do, and I'm going to come in and like, based on those photos, I'm going to try and like draw some more photos, uh, draw some pictures of, of the frog, but here's a little map of where I was. Um, well, I love the map. Oh, and, yeah. and then see, this is also a great idea. Um, so think of all the different ways of, of observing this environment. You've got the map here. You have um, the, uh, you know, the detail of the branch. You've got the landscape ethos drawing of the, Things. Look at all the different ways that Susan is visualizing this place and thinking about it. That's really cool. Well, I would have liked to get up close and personal with the frogs and draw them, but they weren't having any of that. So I am going to draw them from some photos that, that I got. But yeah, that was because I really just was like, like, you know, sort of like almost two hours. I think I just like leaned against the tree, leaned my book against the other trunk of the tree. Oh, here we go. And um, uh, so that I could, you know, just like paint that while listening to frogs. It was very, I, I recommend it. If you can find some, um, <laughs> you can find yourself a nice pool that's got frogs singing, just go, as, as Sharon's saying, just just sit and enjoy it. They're very lovely. The, the wood frogs, they're, they're so great. They, they, have you ever seen the musical, The Music Man? Um, I have not. Oh, well, it's a great musical. It's very fun, but a traveling salesman who's a con artist and falls in love and it's great it's great fun but there's this there's a song in there there's all all the the ladies of the town of this very small town and they all like to go and they all like to gossip about the librarian who's very scandalous because she is a, she lives alone and doesn't and and doesn't seem to be interested in the men so she's very scandalous and they and they there's a there's a song where they go pick a little talk a little pick a little talk a little cheap 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 talk a little, a little more and they do this <laughs> and then i'm thinking so these, these, these are the pick a little talk a little frogs that's what they sound like. So, oh, yeah, they're great. 
Um, oh, that's really <laughs> fun. That's great. I mean, our, uh, you know, when we do the It Reminds Me Of with our nature journal, it just mm -hmm. brings in such richness and relevance. That's, that's great. So, yeah. So that was fun. But I also had a very cool encounter last week. So let me see if I can sort of avoid spoilers. Let's just see if I can sort of position it just right. So I went it's another another, another another wood another forest, another search for oh, by the way, I'm liking that uh, leaf three-quarter view angle curled uh, thing oh, yeah, that was with fun. the veins well, showing the slope of the curve. Yeah, I'm really, really well, it helped that the leaf just was presenting itself just like that for me to draw. So yeah, I so I was I was um another 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 forest, another search for morning cloaks. The weather you can see the temperature was actually good enough that I hoped. I would see them. I didn't. Um, it's like, you know, gotta have butterflies. But I'm some standing on the side of the trail, drawing this leaf. I'm pretty sure it's a beach. I think I looked in a field guide later on, and it had like this exact. Oh, here's here's the um, uh, like the the, the buds. Very very cool. Yeah. Um, so I want to go back there and take a look at them as they open and see what it looks like. So and I'm just, I'm standing there and I'm drawing this and I'm like painting it and everything right there. And then I turn around and yeah. right there. Oh, a hawk literally right across the trail, just staring at me. Oh, wow. So this hawk is just sitting there. He's just, I don't know if it's a boy or girl, but it was just sitting there, just staring at me. Did not seem to mind. I don't know when he showed up there because I didn't hear anything. That's so cool. Yeah. So I'm so here. So here's that you have given us all these wonderful tips on how to, how to, how to draw birds and all kinds of things. And I can tell you that my method's a little bit different. My method is to panic. <laughs> <laughs> so ah! I'm like trying to grab my, I'm trying to like, where's my pencil? What do I do? I don't know. So I'm panicking. So meanwhile, so the hawk kind of like stares for a while and then it just kind of goes and it flies to a different branch. Also, knew, it obviously knew I was there and did not care. Flies to another branch, right around, right around there. Just looking around, looking around. See, so I got some, some. Oh yeah, around. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. So very, very hard. Oh, I wonder look at now, the three quarter views on the tell. head. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. So I noticed that it had it seemed quite, rather small for what I would, would have thought for a hawk. I don't know my hawks very well. Um, and the tail's quite long. I looked at a field guide later on and realized that there's a lot of hawks where the tips of the wings. Kind of coming down to about the same distance as the tail when they're folded, but this one the tail sticks out way beyond the wings. Yeah. Um, and so I did later look, kind of figure out what it was. Oh, I just realized it. it's okay. So I think it's a Cooper's hawk. I'm pretty sure, and I think, yeah. uh, I guess the sharp shinned hawk looks very similar, but I'm pretty sure that's. Yeah. yeah. Th things that feel cool. coopery about it is one of those little sketches shows kind of a dark cap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was trying trying to get that in. And uh, so then, um, also the tail, uh, the base of that tail is very rounded. And mm. those both are Cooper's hawk features. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at the pictures. Yeah, it looks like the sharp shin kind of sort of squares off a little more. And yeah. also there was a bright sort of white edge to it, which I didn't get in the picture. So here's the thing. So I'm drawing it, right? And then, and then it takes off and I'm like, oh. just glides down to the ground, just thump, up, up to a stump. And it had caught something and it starts tearing it apart right in front of me. Oh it was it was like it was like probably 15, 20 feet away. There we go. So 20 feet away. And so it just I actually stood there just watching it for like 30, 40 minutes, just watching it tear oh. it apart and eat it. It was really, really cool. Got some amazing. Oh, that is so, so cool. And I love that head down tearing on the business um, pose there. Yeah, oh. so this this was all this was all I was the thing is the nice thing is it was spending so long with this meal that I had a chance to take some photos and also try and draw it and also try and paint it, which is like the yeah. really cool thing. But yeah, so um uh yeah, so that that was and trying to get that shape just right was was uh really tricky. It's, at one point it had a little bit of spaghetti there. Um uh yeah. <laughs> spaghetti. 
Yeah. So after the fact, then after it flew off, and it actually like took about 30, 40 minutes to eat a large amount of what it, I, I'm pretty sure it was a chipmunk. I'm not quite positive, but it, um, uh, af after it um, had eaten that, and then it flew off with like the remaining half of a, of a carcass. Um, so I went over to the stump where it had been the, the butcher block, as it were, and I went and looked at all the fur that it had pulled off. Um, uh, I thought about actually taking some of the fur and keeping it in my book, but technically you're not supposed to collect things from that preserve, so I didn't, but I just took <laughs> pictures and I drew, some, drew the fur. That's sort of more or less, I should put a scale there because that's more or less the scale. Uh, and then I figured I better document the whole sequence of events, so. Oh, oh. Yeah. This is so this is all drawn after the fact. Um, yeah, yeah, but, but my the, photos the, the, that I the story, yeah. the story, and the insets. Oh, this is so cool. Yes, and I was thinking I've been wa I, I, I've been watching and sometimes rewatching all of your um, uh, your um, Nature Journal Connection videos, and I remembered there was one about where you talk about doing a cartoon. So I'm like, oh, that's what I could do. I could do a cartoon to show the whole sequence or anything. So that was that was. Uh, oh, and 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 and, and so and also look at these sort of these. Um, so first, the the drawing on top, um, with the three birds and the dotted line, connecting them, um, with and then there are little uh, sideways written notes. There's just so much packed into that. Then also notice that the three boxes of equal size overlap the other drawing. I mean, graphically, visually, this is spectacular. And then each one of those drawings in there, you're zooming to a different degree. In one, you're kind of out, sort of showing the, the tug and pull. And then you're zooming in on that little tug. And then, um, just that silhouette, the silhouette um, out through those trees. And look at those, the kind of the hint of some distant trees way back there, just light, light value, but you get a sense that you're in the woods, lovely, dark and deep. Oh. That's, I, I gotta tell you, so when I was, I was uh, um, looking at like, you know, watercolors and at some point in the past, you, if you've talked about the shadow violet color, mm -hmm. and I gotta tell you, that is like, if I could only have one watercolor color, that would that would be it. This is all, all that. Yeah, I think I might be in the same boat. It's for 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 shadow. I mean, I, I mean, lately you've been talking about bloodstone, but I'm like, no, no, no. I got shadow violet. I'm not fine. No, nope, I'm a shadow violet person. <laughs> I got you. But yeah, yeah. So I was really trying to get the impression, especially because I was reading up on them that they are um, like the you know forest birds mostly. So I really wanted to like make sure that I sort of show. Yeah, we're in the forest right here. This is not on the plains. It's not on the side of the forest. We're surrounded by trees. This is um, kind of, well, kind of young-ish forest. It's not old growth forest, but it's, I mean, there are probably some like hundred year old trees in there, but it's an area that I, I don't know what the, what the sort of ultimate plan is for it, but they're trying to take a lot of the pine bush that has become forest and restore it to the sort of original pine barrens habitat that it used to be. So that maybe in the future, they will actually cut down a lot of these trees, which sounds very, jarring but you know we've got lots of lots of forests in new york we're doing final forests and what, what what we do not have so much of is this the pine barrens habitat that's very unique that's part of this this area um so i i don't know I, it's interesting be interesting to see over time what changes are made to mm -hmm. this preserve it has some forest areas and a lot of non-forested areas and i guess the cooper's hawks will have to move if that happens but they've got lots of other forests they can go to but yeah, so so I do. I have some really cool photos, and I do want to. Um, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try and do some like bigger, like you know, drawings or paintings from that. But I haven't had them yet. So yeah. <clears throat> but, but also, I just want to just say again, from a graphic design standpoint and a visual storytelling standpoint, that last page just you just rocked my world. Uh, there are some very useful ideas that I'm now intentionally um, hacking away. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna make a little doodle here. I don't know, I feel like I stole all that from you, so. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. 
when we should, when, when we should always steal from other artists. It's great. Yeah. There's a distant one. Here's the, the, the up close one. And then here's the medium with the, with the two birds. And then there's, there are these trees in the background. And, and then we're up on a branch and we're flying down. And then we're coming up on a stump. And then you have the words diagonally in there. There's just, it was, it was dense. It was dense with stuff. Yeah, that was, that was, that was, it was fun because I, I wasn't really thinking about having these like overlap when I, when I did it. I was really just thinking about that, that I could draw the beginning of the sequence all as one image because it was sort of this motion, but that the rest of the sequence is all kind of happening in the same place. And so I had to do that. And then it wasn't until I started adding in some color and I'm like, well, I, need to get, I have to get the leaf litter in. So I started uh, like, oh, I could put that as the background or something. So yeah, it all kind of developed very organically, but I was, I was yeah. trying, you know, here the problem I have sometimes I think is like trying to get too much detail in and then either then I panic and don't finish like my, you know, deer painting from 21 years ago <laughs> that I never finished, um, you know, or, uh, or it ends up being like so much detail that you can't really see the, um, uh, you know, like the point of it anymore. So I'm trying to go for like, let's keep it simple. We'll get enough information that you can see what's actually happening because the point was to, to show like what was the sequence of events of this bird because I'm, I'm never going to be that close ever to a hawk that's catching and eating its prey ever again. This is definitely a once in a Well, at least you haven't yet. Well, okay. I mean, did, did hawks make a habit of catching prey like 15 feet away from a human that's just watching it? I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's a regular common occurrence. Okay. I'm saying that you are spending your time in the woods. That is a good point. That is true. And those um when you put in your time in the woods um nature shows up for you because you're showing up for nature that's true and if you're very quiet there was uh which i think probably the fact that i was very quiet and concentrating yeah. very carefully i think when so. it showed up was probably i was as i was watching this and this was like half an hour other people are coming along the trails so i see this 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 mother and these two kids that are these little like very like i don't know four years old or so just just hopping and skipping along the trail in the distance I sort of, Wave my hand. I went, and <laughs> so so they so the mom saw and then got the kids to be quiet and they could sort of like creep along and see as well. And the, did they get to see it too? Out. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. They get to see it tearing apart with all the blood and guts everywhere. I hope, hope uh, <laughs> the mom didn't, didn't have any difficulty explaining that later on. But you know, it's nature. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was it was pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Wow, uh, thanks so much for sharing that adventure. Thank you. Um, wow. So folks, you know, this can happen to you too. But the thing is, you have to show up for nature um, and want to encourage people to try to find um, find an, an opportunity to, to slow down and pay attention and a wild space near you. And if you can't get out to a wild space, you can you can find uh, you know, just by looking more carefully at, you know, what are the birds right outside your window doing? Like, are they coming down in a big dense flock? You know, who's out to the side? How are they? Do they leave together? Who stays behind? All these sorts of the mysteries. Um, it's 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 less. It's it's not it's not where you look. It's how you look. And. Um, uh, Susan, that's that was really inspiring. That was, was pretty exciting. Um, <clears throat> again, everybody, this Wednesday, I mean, not this Wednesday, this uh, is it, uh, Eve, is my birthday Saturday? I think it's your birthday is Sunday, isn't that April 3rd? Saturday, Sunday, April 3rd. Um, let me, I will have to look on a calendar here. Um, there's April. Um, yeah, it's Sunday. Hey, I, um, I want to encourage everybody, um, perhaps this weekend to go uh, give yourself, treat yourself to a little adventure, treat yourself to a little adventure, grab your journal, 
and um, go tromping out into the woods and see what happens. Um, and sometimes, you know, uh, the uh, ancient Greeks believed that, you know, in order to, uh, that you needed to, if you wanted to learn some skill, you needed to practice and practice and practice. And the reason wasn't neuroplasticity is basically you had to show the muse that you were serious. You had to show the muse that you were serious. And so what you want to do is by showing up for nature is, is, is uh, show nature that like, no, I'm, 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 I'm here. I'm here and just get out there and, and enjoy it, find beauty wherever you, you are. Sometimes an event like Susan just described happens right in front of us. Sometimes it doesn't, but even if it doesn't, uh, if you've trained yourself how to lean into the little things, you will find wonder and beauty right there. And then when you turn around and there's something dramatic going on, um, the, your brain is pre-adapted to soak it all up. Um, I remember when we had our a, a nature journaling safari in Tanzania. On our, our first day, we, we arrive uh, at, at, at the park in, a, in our little vehicles. And there was, there's some bathrooms there and hanging from the ceiling was a little tiny wasp nest, a little paper wasp nest with some exquisite wasps on it. And all of the nature journalers um, were just around and it was like just drawing the wasps and, you know, all these other uh, people who are you know there at this this in this parking area they're like like what did, they, they had they could not fathom what we were doing um just looking at some wasps um but you know that experience was as is as as vivid as the giraffe down the trail and um you know uh, uh, later on we were we were driving along and there were some agamid lizards out on this uh, rock, and and we were we stopped and, and we're we're looking at these these lizards. And what vehicles will often do is they will see like there's a vehicle and everybody's looking out their window. They're looking at something. Let's go over to there. So another vehicle came zooming over to see like like you know the cheetah, and they you know they 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 stopped their car. They all got out their binoculars. They all looked in the same direction. They were going. And then they were kind of looking at each other. And then they looked at us and they looked at each other and they looked at each other. And they, 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 there, was, there was nothing there. They were like, where is it? And we point, it's on the rock. Right. And they looked back at the rock and there was a gamut lizards there. And they're like, um, where is it? It's on the rock. Then one of the people said, are you looking at the lizards? And we went, yeah, aren't they beautiful? And just this, these, these looks of <laughs> just sheer disgust and disappointed appeared across the, all the faces in the other band. And they went tearing off in a cloud of dust. And we had a great time looking at a gamut lizards. So um, again, it's, uh, there's, there's wonder and beauty wherever you choose to look. Um, and uh, I want to encourage people to bring with you a trash bag and see what happens if you leave the place that you explore. So one way of doing this is to, to kind of go in and then do a little cleanup or another, if you're going in on a trail and back out on the same trail, sometimes you can go in journaling and back out collecting. And that way you don't have to carry your bag of trash um, the whole way because you know you could just carry it half of that way. Um, and, uh, the, uh, and just sort of pay attention to how that makes you feel about the place. And I think you might find that as Vea has motivated me to do, um, that keeping a, a, a little trash bag in your nature journaling supplies is a, is a really great piece of equipment, just like a non-photo blue pencil. Speaking of the mad botanist, I'm gonna bring you back on if that's okay.
Um, I just want to uh, thank you again for what you've done to uh, bring the importance of stewardship into the conversations about this community that we have in this community. And um, that really has just opened up all sorts of doors to deeper connection with place. Um, and just wanted to, wanted to hear any, if you had any thoughts about that. Um, that I'm so thankful that you joined me, um, that you go out into these places that you carry the trash bags and that even if on that particular day, your only witnesses are the birds and the trees and the insects flying all around you, they're all thanking you for that. Um, because, because you are, you're making the world a better place, even just a little bit at a time. And, and it's special when you, it, it's even more, especially because of the isolation of COVID, it's even more special when you get to have company out there doing that with you. So whether we're in person together, or we just know that each other are doing it all over the world, we know we're not alone. And, and just going back for a second to my own birthday, I can't even stress how special it was this year when you and Anne and Jasmine and our whole group of friends joined in and came with me because that was like bridging two really, really precious worlds. Um, the world of caring about the environment and then having my nature journal friends join in because that when you're out there doing this stuff together, that's what creates the culture that as a community, we can do this. Um, that like you're, you hear about global warming and it freaks you out, but then you're like, but wait, me and my comrades in arms have already been out here in this field doing this thing together. Okay, when are we going to do this next? Do <laughs> you know, That's right. That's um, right. It's not just you against the world. It's like, <laughs> okay, well, now we have a community where I look around. Oh, everybody's in, everybody's active. Everybody's being active. Everybody's being an activist. And so um, just, it's never too late to join in. And if you're having an off day and you can't make it that day, that's fine. Don't pressure yourself. Um, it'll be there waiting for you and you just start and start and start again and so thank you for joining in deeply wise thank you thank all of you for being here and we look forward to uh playing with you again soon take care everyone and happy early birthday jack if we thank you. you but thank you so much I'm, <laughs> I'm looking forward to it oh 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 um um, for the birthday, we've got a birthday hashtag if you want to take a picture of you with your trash can. So um, hashtag journal stewards. Hashtag journal stewards. We'll see you there, everybody. Thank you, Jack.